everybody. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Annie and Kate. Hello, Annie. Hey, folks. How are we all doing today? You good? And I'd like to welcome our guest, Tracy Spicer. Hello. Thanks for having me on and lovely to see you both again. It is a true delight to have you here. And I'm going to do the introduction this time. So Tracy Spicer, an amazing person. Uh, she's a multiple Walkley Award winning author a journalist and broadcaster. I remember seeing her on the news many, many times. Uh, she was also the inaugural national convener of women in media, and she has built a, a remarkable career as a keynote speaker and an MC, and also a media trainer, which is one of the um, guises that I've had dealings with her in. So welcome, Tracy. Thank you for the lovely warm introduction. It's very, very kind. I have a bit of a strange career, a portfolio career where I do bits and pieces of things that I'm interested in. Although those kind of careers seem to be much more popular these days than they used to be. I think not just popular as well, Tracy, but also particularly as I look at the you know, sort of generations of women coming behind us, that's exactly what they want. They want to be able to sort of have many strings to their bow. And I'm I think it's great that we're able to you know, sort of have those career paths now and that it's not an unusual path anymore. Mm. Well, I, I always think it's fascinating that women see choices that they think that they can do. They don't just need to go get a full-time job, that they think they can do stuff part-time, they can have a portfolio career and stuff, whereas men just think, I've got to get a job. Anyway, men, who can, who can understand them? We'll leave them somewhere else, Kate. Let's ask, let's go to our normal for, um, questions and Annie, you can ask your first one. All right, I'm going to ask one of my perennial favourites, if that's okay, Tracy. So, if you could go back to your younger self, and you can choose which age, it could be you know, in your teens or at university or in your first job, and you could go back and tell your younger self one piece of advice, what advice would you give? I would say stand up for yourself a lot earlier because eventually I did. Eventually I stood up and, you know, took a TV network to court about pregnancy discrimination and spoke out and wrote about sexual harassment and gender inequality more broadly. But it took me an awfully long time. The first couple of decades in the workplace, I was very much yes sir, no sir, three bags full sir, you know, that whole good girl syndrome that I'd internalised from the society around me. So like a lot of uh, people my age, I'm 53 now, you know, you really want to say to the young women that you mentor, own your power earlier, use all the tools at your disposal. So what was the moment? So we've talked about this with a few other women on the podcast before that you, you get to a moment. Is it that there was something that tipped you over the edge? Or was it just like a series of, you know, death by a thousand cuts and you kind of said, fuck it, I'm going to stand up for myself. Was there a moment or was it just a series of moments that led you to that? It's a series of small moments and then one thing happens and your head explodes. Or as I wrote about in my book, it lights a fire in your belly. And for me, that was losing my job when I had a baby and a toddler and I was exhausted and there was no reason. And they just said, you have no more job after 14 years. And I was like, right, that's enough. Not just for me, but for all women and also an opportunity. You know, when you do finally stand up for yourself, I actually saw it as a great opportunity and privilege to be able to, as a journalist, start a national conversation about pregnancy and maternity discrimination to in some way hopefully help the one in two women who are experiencing it at that time. That's a shocking statistic, isn't it? It really is. And look, the statistic is slightly better now, but also people who perpetrate this kind of stuff have become better at hiding it and more sneaky. It used to be quite overt back in the day, you know, that ask you in job interviews, are you going to have children? You know, I remember going for, um, what was it, a home loan or something like that, my first home loan, and I had to get my mum and dad to go as guarantor because I was a single woman, you know, all the things that you think and back on. And I had, I, My parents had to be guarantor on my first mortgage as well. It's oh, absurd. really, Annie? Yeah, and here's another stat for you, or here's another anecdote. Um, women who are going for funding now for tech startups, whether it's here in Australia or anywhere else in the world, will often still be asked by venture capitalists or investors, are you planning on having children? No. Still, it, there are some things that are still 
systemically wrong and the questions are asked without any care or attention for well, that's just not the right thing to ask or it's not remotely acceptable nor is it actually important but they still ask it anyway because you know they're sat in the seat of power with all the money and it's hilarious like, because oh, sorry because i often give i often think give give the job to a woman with kids she can juggle plenty of stuff hell yes <laughs> give the job to a busy person that's what my mum always used to say it's true and you know, while I think legislative change is incredibly important, changing policies and procedures, that's where the cultural change comes in. Because mm. those kind of questions have been outlawed since, from my memory, 1984 and the Sex Discrimination Act in Australia. But it's the cultural change that lags, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Hey, what are we drinking? Hang oh, on. I've, I've, got, um, I've got a lovely... Cabernet Sauvignon from Margaret River. Oh, how nice. What about you, Kate? I've got, I've got a, um, a GSM from uh, France. Oh, how wonderful. Very highbrow. How about you, Tracy? Well, this will make you laugh. I'm drinking an Italian Fiano. And when I said that in front of the teenagers before, one of them turned around and said, oh, you wanker. <laughs> <laughs> And then I said, don't worry, because I'm from Queensland, I've put ice in it, so I'm clearly not a wine drinker. <laughs> well, but looks like the drop. you need those stones that you freeze and put in it so that it doesn't yeah. water it down. Oh, I don't know about those stones. Where do you, you know, get them? You can get, well, they, they're either called wine stones or whiskey stones. So whiskey stones. In, um, in any beverage. Uh, but basically, you just put them in the, free, in the freezer put them in your drink, they act like an ice cube, but they don't dilute your drink. I knew there was a reason I liked you gals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ask us anything about booze. We, we know yeah. stuff. <laughs> we know all of the important things. We're gonna whip out and buy those straight away. I, I'm gonna, I wanna ask you a question and it's, it's a question that I do like to ask. And it's, what, what is your favorite tool? And it could be anything. I don't mean necessarily a power tool or a drill or anything. But you know, what is the favorite, your favorite go-to tool that you use all the time? It's going to sound like a very boring answer, unfortunately, but it's my laptop for the simple fact that when the pandemic hit, my husband and I work freelance. We lost all of our work in March, April, May last year. And so we had to, and I hate this word, pivot very quickly. Sounds like a whole bunch of netballers, that's cool. Um, and do all of our work from home, emceeing and keynote speaking from my four-year-old Apple Mac, <laughs> which I set up on a stand in the foyer with the book uh, bookshelf in the background. And I'd put a little written sign on the front door, we are on air, please couriers do not knock. But the great thing about the laptop, of course, is not only can you work from anywhere, just typing or whatever, I've done Zoom and Teams meetings in the craziest places since the pandemic. So if I'm without my laptop, I feel like I've lost a limb. I'm that addicted to it now. All right, tell us the craziest places you've done a Zoom or a Teams meeting. <laughs> yeah, that's the question I wanted to ask too. <laughs> On the beach, which is insane, because I was driving from somewhere to somewhere else and I got stuck in traffic and I thought I'm not going to get to the location to be able to do it. So I just diverted and I sat on the beach and it was close to sunset, so the lighting was great. And I just said, what a wonderful location and incorporated that into the presentation. <laughs> that's incredible. That's not, that, that's not weird, that's awesome. I did a Zoom meeting the other day in the, in the lobby near the lifts. So I'd have to keep, <laughs> yeah, no, well, I'd have to keep muting same. myself when the lift opened and said, going down. <laughs> you had the ding ding all the time oh, that's hilarious oh so in most crazy place my poor dad uh, became very ill last week we were terribly worried about him he lives in brisbane and i live in sydney so i flew up randomly you know while the borders open really wanted to see him got to see him ended up having to do a zoom meeting in the hospital now that was that was great <laughs> yeah that's an awkward one i've um my um and kate knows this my Dad's been quite sick recently, so I had to go home to uh, England. He's um, just gone through chemotherapy for leukemia. So oh, I'm so sorry, Annie. Ah, oh, look, trust me, it's 
many people have gone through some terrible stuff over COVID and over the last six or 12 months and our family is no different, but having to do, you know, sort of team meetings sat in a COVID restrained, you know, sort of part of a, a, a cancer specialist hospital is, is quite something because you are not allowed in certain parts of the hospital, but you also need to be in a certain part of the waiting room, otherwise you don't get the Wi-Fi. So it's just sort of, uh, you, you end up sort of figuring out who the best janitors and, you know, sort of um, nurse monitors are and just say, look, I need to be in that part of the room. I'm going to be there for 40 minutes because I just need to do this call. I'm not going to do anything else. I'm not going to irritate anybody. Just let me do my call and then I'll be out of here. And they're like, yeah, 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 carry on. It's fine. But um, if they don't, if, if they don't know who you are and you're hanging around because of COVID, they literally just will whisk you out of the hospital waiting room now. I was going to say, yeah, you were lucky to get Wi-Fi in the hospital. Oh no, the Wi-Fi was always fine. That was never a problem. It was just if you were sat in the same spot for more than half an hour, there was a rule that you are not allowed to be in that spot for more than half an hour. So they would just literally move you on. Fascinating. Wow. It's a different world, isn't it? It is. It is indeed. And, and that was one of the questions we did want to talk to you about though, Tracy, is sort of you know, how you went from you know, sort of perhaps kind of quite a predictable and you know, a business that you've been running for quite some time as an MC and you know, keynote speaker to then what did it feel like to have to change everything and, and look at your look at the way that you did business? Look, a, a lot of people have been through plenty of worse things, but it was interesting because last year I decided that all of my work was going to be at events and conferences because I love the energy of the crowd, you know, and it's lovely meeting people and socialization. It's just fun. And then when that disappeared, I, my, uh, my friend Ginger Gorman said, you, you lent on your television, didn't you? You kind of pivoted back to television because a lot of, um, presenting online, you know, talking to a lens, talking to a camera is very much like what newsreaders do. And because I did that for 20 years, I've been teaching a lot of people online how to present online. So it, it actually ended up working out quite well and diversified my business a lot more. The other thing that happened was for the last four years, I have been supposed to be writing another book. Don't tell anybody. I've been <laughs> you tell anybody. it madly. But COVID completely destroyed my brain and I could not even write a sentence, let alone a column or a chapter or a book. So just this week, I'm delighted to say I've finally written the first chapter for a new book. I finally feel mentally ready for it. And what, what, what do you think sort of you know, changed the way that your brain pathways worked over COVID that you couldn't write? I was talking to a friend of mine who's a psychologist about this today and she was saying everyone who even has mild anxiety had increased anxiety through COVID and I have very mild anxiety because of the uncertainty about the future. Mm -hmm. And when you're constantly in either low or medium level fight, flight or freeze, you've got such high levels of cortisol that it's very di difficult for you to think straight and particularly for you to think creatively. You're just thinking about the day to day. Okay, how am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to get through today to get to tomorrow? So I spoke to a lot of authors who were supposed to be writing another book, and they said, "I've just given up until the end of the pandemic because I can't think." Yeah, it's it's really interesting because you, you don't you don't think of that as as a task as a kind of a labour that you have to have space to do, but so many people went into how am I going to survive you know uh, so many of my friends did and uh, there was genuine genuine existential dread amongst a lot of people you know they were thinking I'm gonna get thrown out of my home I'm not going to be able to eat you know it's really quite this is the biggest thing that's happened in our lifetime you've put that so eloquently Kate you're absolutely right it's an existential crisis and so people just had to go back to the basics. Am I going to be able to feed myself and my family? What does this mean about life? Are we on this endless hamster, you know, hamster wheel 
and it could end at any time with a worldwide pandemic. Why should we plan for the future when we don't know what's going to happen? Let's all so, make sourdough instead. Sorry? Let's all make sourdough bread. Everybody I know was making sourdough bread. Oh, Even my brother. That? Oh, really? I did that too. Did you make the sourdough mother, the really smelly thing in the fridge? He did that. No, I didn't. I didn't make bread. I made banana bread because that's what I, I, I bought. Do. I bought sourdough bread many times. <laughs> I think there was that sense of returning to the basics, you know, trying to look after yourself. I think that the interesting thing for me, so as I mentioned, I went back home for a little while for six months and Nate knows this. I, while I was there, it was still full on lockdown. And then I came back, I should have been back about just over seven weeks now, seven or eight weeks. And, and just the difference for me from going coming back from full on lockdown, middle of winter, and you know all of that sort of stuff that went with it to literally the day after I came out of hotel quarantine, I went to Hamilton the musical. So <laughs> talk about going from one extreme to another. And you know, I, find, I find it really interesting how Australia has navigated through all of this, you know, relatively unscathed to be fair and I know a few hundred people have lost their lives and that's terrible but in you know in comparison to other countries it's just absolutely nothing and then when you look at you know the recovery of the entertainment sector the conference circuit starting to reboot again and here's my question for you Tracy on that one one question I have on this is do you think the the speaker and the conference circuit is going to go back to normal or do you think that we're going to keep some of the lessons or some of the, the online kind of nature of what we had to do through COVID throughout this? It's impossible to crystal ball gaze and companies are going different ways. But I think the most successful path forward is a combination where you have, and I've emceed a few events like this in the last six months, you have a group of people in a room in Brisbane, you know, a relatively large group, and perhaps in Adelaide. So the cities where you can have larger gatherings, there are larger groups in a room. You have smaller groups in other cities where you can't have that. And then you also have an online offering. So it's a hybrid conference where someone like me would present it from a studio or from my home, or even in front of the small group in the city where the MC lives. And the benefit for that is you get people in the room, but you also get more eyeballs from particularly around the Asia Pacific region, but also all over the world. So organizations are seeing that you can really successfully combine these two things, actually get more of an audience. And I, I don't think it'll ever go back to just being people in the room or just being online. I think we'll have a combo. So we, we've had a really interesting thing happen at work. So we do daily stand-ups and the team have elected to do their daily stand-ups on teams on one of the days they all work from home because they prefer the experience to having uh, having everybody in the one room. They, they feel that the tools are actually better in teams uh, so they can look at their, their backlog and they can look at their, their cards and stuff online much better than they can if they're all in the same room. Oh, that makes sense because they can't necessarily have all of their notes in front of them if it's all in the same room. And, and Kate, I imagine that, you know, a lot of them, it will be less nerve wracking for them doing it in front of a computer at home compared with doing it in a room where, as one of my students said to me one day, I have all those beady eyeballs looking back at me. <laughs> I think, I just think it's, it's actually, um, I think everybody's become so used to it uh, that, it seems really normal and it feels kind of alien going back in, into a room altogether. I went back to the office for the first time in a year, uh, not last week, the week before, just for half a day. I've not done it again since. <laughs> I just, I can't, I, d I don't need to do it. I love meeting people and quite happy to do that over a coffee or a cup of tea or lunch, but I just don't feel the need to be in an office to have, to do my work. Well, yeah. it's hilarious. So Microsoft have, because nobody's in the office, the place is chocker with merch. I've sent someone to get some for my team. Okay. <laughs> well, isn't the research bearing that out, that the vast majority of people only want to be in an office, say, two days a week and the rest of the time working from home with the technology? Mm. 
Well, it makes sense on so many different levels. And yeah, back to that conversation we had just then around, yeah, having more of a hybrid scenario when it comes to conferences and events. If you then look at some of the other statistics around, if you want for you know, genuine representation and accessibility for the audience that you're probably trying to serve, conferences are typically usually very much overpriced for parts of the market that you probably do want to have in the room, or just they're really problematic for single mums or people with a disability or you sort of so many different parts of society that just never had the opportunity to be in the room and listen to the conversation as it happened and feel part of it and feel part of that community and I love that now that we can do that for anybody anywhere in the world who wants to listen to you talk Tracy or to you speak about you know security Kate or to listen to me waffle on about how awesome dogs are you know seriously we, we should be able to democratize that access. You are absolutely right and that is one of the wonderful changes we've seen in the last year. It's become more accessible and more affordable to get this kind of information. That's a really terrific insight. It was really interesting. I did a talk at the Australian Institute of Professional Intelligence Officers last night. Ooh. And it went until it eight o'clock. Say that again. The Australian Institute of Professional Intelligence Officers. You know, that's like very spooks. impressive. That's cool. Spooks. And it was really interesting because it was a really diverse group. Um, and and we had uh, mics on at the start, and then we took it around to turn. But there were clearly children and babies in the room, so everybody had the opportunity to participate and didn't have any childcare issues or anything. And I thought that was really quite interesting. Definitely. That's a huge issue, particularly for women. I also like how you get to see something about the person's real personality and home life, whether you see a dog or a cat in the background, whether you see some pictures of their family, whether you see some guitars in the corner, and then, you know, the person, you know, plays guitar in their, in their spare time. I think it's really lovely and personal. Oh, have you seen Rate? Have you seen Room Rater? Oh gosh, yes. I love that. It's Room awesome. Rater. So uh, there's a basically it's a Twitter account online, and they they literally look at people's um, you know sort of home home setups. So I've seen some of your home setups, Tracy. I, I know the scenario that you've you know, you, you often post the here's what it looks like in real life, and then here's what's on the screen. So what they what they do is they rate the the background, they wrote the setup, they rate the lighting, and they give you a they give you a rating out of ten. Yeah, it's very very cool, and particularly with bookshelves that that I, I think it's that account that goes through the type of book sh that you've got on your bookshelf and makes comments about that too. Yes, and whether or not they're they're either kind of categorized by color of the cover or you alphabetizing or by size. My, my bookcases are so not organized like that as well. So I'm, gl I'm grateful that I never do any Zooms in front of my bookcase because I, I would just- now I'm conscious of what's in my bookshelf behind <laughs> And then there's the pile of books over there. They're all terrorism books. I think we would get a very good rating just because, Kate. Um, but now, now, I've become, now I'm like, what about those books behind me? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, see, the good thing there, Kate, is you can't see them. So yeah. it looks impressive and neat, but no one's ever going to judge it. Excellent. So what's the, what's the next book you're writing about, Tracy? It's about um, the intersection between artificial intelligence and machine learning and race and gender. So hashtag AI bias. It's something I've been obsessed with for about five years. And finally, I've started to do some writing on it because... While we're all thinking about the pandemic now, I'm confident that in two years' time, we are all going to be obsessed with this area about, I mean, you both know how much life will change in the next two years, five years, 10 years because of the, the advances in technology, which bring wonderful things, but also a lot of inbuilt bias. It's a huge issue. 100%. I mean, it, artificial intelligence, we haven't, really seen the true application of it yet within you know our, our main kind of lives and day-to-day -day. and artificial intelligence is still very very nascent as a as a technology well, as well, as well we, we just don't it. see it yet yeah it's there it's there and it's going to increasingly be making decisions on our behalf 
And when you put it together with things like the Internet of Things, there's going to be devices at the edge of the network making decisions about your stuff with no reference to any human beings. It's, so, you know, it's it, that whole area of bias is such an important area that we all need to be talking about. It is huge, you know, and what you said about the Internet of Things, it's just terrifying to think that life and death decisions could be made by a device that could be an appliance that, you know, that has got, it's got bias built into it because of the people doing the coding. And, and you both know this, a lack of diversity and inclusion more broadly in the technical space globally. Yeah, it's actually quite terrifying. I've got a friend who's got a Google Home that his kid won in a raffle. He would normally not have this kind of device in his home. And we had a conversation recently about rowing machines because I was thinking of buying a rowing machine. And he, he has now been inundated with ads for rowing machines. Well, no, it, we Kate and I have spoken about this a couple of weeks back when she was over here having a couple of gin and tonics with me. She was talking about the fact she was going to buy a rowing machine. Then a day later, I got adverts oh, you too. on Facebook. Sorry about that. And I don't even, I don't even have the Facebook that. app on my phone or on my laptop. I just have it as a web browser every now and again. So I've literally no idea how that seeped through, but it does. And, and oh no, that that's 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 why the if you've got the if you've got an Apple device, an iOS device, update it immediately because there I is have. a new release that blocks all of that that basically will break Facebook's business model. I downloaded oh, it as wow. soon as it was available. It's got it default thing. turned on and it will block all third party tracking. God bless Tim Cook. I love him. Oh, thank you. That is amazing. Yeah, seriously. It, uh, yesterday, I think the software became available and, it, and it's, uh, look, there are some other schools of thought that say, that say Apple have done it so that they can deliberately earn more, um, uh, it, it, the transaction between Apple and other devices. So if you then say that you're okay, for that that data to be transferred from one app to the other, Apple gets a higher cut of that um, of that transaction than if the uh, the tracking wasn't enabled. So other people are saying Apple are just making more money out of it. I don't care. I'm like Kate. I want to be you know I want to lock everything down. I don't want Facebook to get any of any more of my data. I hate Facebook so much. And this is just fascinating, though, isn't it? How how very seeped into our society that some of these applications are that perhaps we kind of downloaded thinking, oh, it's just a bit of fun. It's just a nice way for me to connect to my friends and family around the world. A bit of Facebook is not going to change my life, but actually it does. You know, there, there's the listening and, you know, the fact that it's now connected to WhatsApp and Instagram and everything else. It's just it's pervasive. Mm. Absolutely. How do you both manage your privacy on a day-to-day -day basis with technology when you work in the sector? I gave up on privacy in the 90s. Yeah, I think, I think you have to sort of accept largely because, I mean, Kate and I spend a lot of our time on Twitter. We, we talk about our, our lives as much as we comment and we, we share and, and all the other things that go with it. So I think if I've chosen to share it, that's fine. But if you know, Facebook and Instagram and the like are doing it behind our backs without our knowledge, that's a very different thing. It's the, it, it's, you know, the advice that I give everybody is use, use a password manager. Don't be using your pet's name as your password. Use multi-factor authentication on everything that you can turn it on for. And don't, and don't tell anybody your real birth date except the bank and the tax office. So that, they're the only people that need to know that stuff. Oh, you're very wise. That's incredibly sensible. But, but you know, like, I feel no shame in just lying to some random website. It's like, why would I tell you the truth? What pisses me off about the AI bias stuff is that the companies know it's an issue, but they're not going to spend the money to fix it because it will cost money to change the data sets that are fed into the machine learning. And I guess that just infuriates me from a social justice perspective. But I do think there's an opportunity, particularly in Australia, to do something, because you know how often they'll test out things in Australia, we can be a little bit of a test market for technology and different, you know, you would have seen the, the legislation with the federal government lately. I just think it's um it's a it's about time that they will put on notice 
I, you'd both be aware of the um, Algorithmic Justice League. Yep. Oh, I think that woman is incredible. The work that she's done and the documentary Coded Bias, it's a big conversation overseas, but we're just not having it here yet. I think we have an opportunity to potentially, you know, change things. I think I agree with you entirely. And I would only add one thing. I think Australia has absolutely got an opportunity to you know, sort of take a step ahead than, than perhaps other markets do. But the other thing that's really important, I think, is for us to recognise and remember that we have a, an incredible rich culture of 60 odd thousand years of Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander people who genuinely have got a huge amount of knowledge, a huge amount of data that we aren't even capturing yet and that we need to we need to bring um aboriginal and torres strait islanders into this because that concept of, of um data sets is so much more than just whether or not it's gender or um you know sort of access uh, 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 what background you come from whether whether it's an accessibility issue or color of skin but if you think about when you look at down a cultural lens of of indigenous peoples there's if we don't if we don't put the right structure in place it could just be another generational gap that we have where we haven't served that part of the population at all you are absolutely right and i will definitely be interviewing both of you for my book <laughs> because you're absolutely right there could be you know almost an erasure of a lot of people of a lot of history of a lot of culture if nothing is done now Mm -hmm. Well, there, there's there's a whole lot of um, standards activity. So standards are how we um, we get organised on the web. So the web standards are the way that we organise how you you interact with each other in known and predictable ways. So there's a, a whole lot of standards that define how web browsers work and things like that. So we do, there's a bunch of uh, people around the world who've been working on um, AI ethics. Uh, for a number of years now. Um, so I can introduce you to a whole bunch of people. So I'm on an IEEE um, committee that's considering uh, ethical use of AI, uh, developing standards around that. Uh, oh, and that would be amazing. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, because, because if we bake it into the standards, then that's just how everyone will build stuff and that's how it'll interact. So if we leave it to the companies, they're, they're not going to care. Uh, so absolutely we... right because aren't there didn't the um the un and and some global bodies come out with guidelines a couple of years ago as well whether that makes any difference or not it's another they matter did. and actually yeah microsoft was one of the folks behind a lot of that which um so brad smith our president of the company uh he's, he's kind of he's very passionate about ethics in ai and ethics around how technology companies turn up and here's the interesting uh, stat for you or, or story, that whole AI ethics structure that it was sponsored by the UN, Microsoft and a bunch of other companies, ratified by many other countries uh, around the world, Australian government refused to ratify it. Why? What was the Australian government's reason? It was, it was too generous to um, you know, underrepresented groups and it basically, I, I'm going to, read between the lines here it probably took power away from Rupert Murdoch yeah pretty much so so this this is why this is why you know I, I've had the focus on let's work on the standards the the standards that everybody builds to and stuff because um back in the day when we first started with the web standards and sort of late 90s early 2000s all the big companies like Microsoft IBM and stuff didn't even want to have that conversation, but eventually they had to, because it was more efficient for everybody to standardize than it was for them to keep going in their own proprietary way. So we could have interoperability and stuff. So that, I think that's the way to do it. But, you know, there's been really egregious stuff like that. Google with their um, AI ethics researchers being oh, fired by email and stuff. Just ridiculous. Absolutely embarrassing. So Tim, it, uh, Tim, it, Gerber, I think her name is. She was basically the lead um, uh, lead person who's sort of running the AI research and looking at how to you know make sure that bias wasn't 
um, part of it, and they they fired her, and they didn't even tell her she was. I think she was on leave. She was on time. leave or something, and they fired her by email. And she, yeah, and then then the rest of her team have followed her. So you know, but Google, you know, they said don't be evil. It was obviously on their mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so well, I want to go back to one little thing. Um, how how did you end up with this um, really interesting new career? Because you had you know your broadcasting career you won your walkley awards you obviously got fired when you were pregnant which really made you mad how did you then regroup and create this amazing career oh that's very kind of you to say but um i sort of think that i did my career backwards most journalists you know do a degree or do an internship or a cadetship then they go into writing for newspapers or magazines or these days online, and then they do broadcast. I did it backwards. I went into radio first and then television. And all those years, I had a burning passion for writing. I was one of those nerdy 12-year-olds who was writing poetry in her room, right? So <laughs> when I lost my job, I thought, what a great opportunity to actually write and to not only write news stories, even though I'm interested in news, but to write stuff that I'm passionate about and express a bit of an opinion so then I had sort of 10 years of pretty intense writing about feminism, social justice, a little bit of travel stuff. I like to travel as well to have something a bit lighthearted also. So in a way, it was a blessing in disguise losing my job because it meant that I could diversify my skill set. So it really opened, opened new doors for you. Yeah, it really did unexpectedly. And I developed an absolute love for the written word. And also, you know, we talk about gender a lot it is a lot easier to write from home particularly when you've got two small kids rather than having to be in a workplace so I edited some magazines I learned how to edit magazines while I was at home so it was really um a very good family friendly way of learning new skills and segueing into something else although you know to be honest with both of you I do believe in lifelong learning so when the pandemic hit last year I went off and did the company director's course at the AICD because that was something I'd always wanted to do. And I developed a passion completely unexpectedly for governance and risk and finance and bloody, <laughs> okay. you know, who would have yes, thought, balance sheets. And I'm fascinated by that now and on a couple of boards. So you, you never stop learning. All right, I'm going to have to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> Why would you be that interested in balance sheets? I know, it's a weird rabbit hole. When, when I went to, look... We've got um, two kids, a 14-year-old girl and a 16-year-old boy. And it's been lovely to watch our girl over the last 10 years become more and more obsessed with maths. Maths calms her. She loves numbers. And over the last 10 years, I've been thinking back to my own schooling. And I ended up being uh, ducks of the school in both English and maths. So... While I've taken more of a, an English type of career, I, I kind of decided that I missed the maths and I missed the structure and the calming aspect of numbers. So when I did the course last year, I was delighted to discover that I really liked looking at numbers again. <laughs> it's a weird story, but your kids teach you so much. You, they teach you as much as you teach them. And that is an excellent note to end on. Thank you so much, Tracy. It's lovely to see you again. And look forward to being interviewed for the book. <laughs> yes. Oh, I can't wait to interview you both. It will definitely happen in the next couple of months because I'm fired up again. Look, thank you both for everything that you do, not only when it comes to gender equality, but also technology. I mean, that's sort of the really pointy end of this kind of stuff. I love what you both do. You're both wonderful human beings. And thank you for asking me. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.